Thank you, gentlemen, for these excellent presentations. And we, uh, we try to find some overlaps, or even better for the moderators, some contradictions. And um, I think there will be a lot of interesting discussions also after uh, the official sessions with your provocation. Probably some people would come to, to talk to you privately. But let's do some uh, official looking for, for, for overlaps. And I, I will use his quite provocative uh, hypothesis to, to, to check whether you gentlemen can m maybe find an answer. He, kind of, he destroyed my whole uh, theory courses at university in economics. I mean, all the Kondratiev things. But you, I were, you were never there anyway. Uh, <laughs> yes, I was, and I thought that the steam machine and uh, you destroyed everything. So, may, But maybe these uh, gentlemen can help us to... Uh, but maybe you're right, so that will be sad. But if Klaus Velishoff says, forget about technology, doesn't matter for growth. We have a dean of the ETH here. You, you do nothing else but technology. Would you contradict him that uh, technology doesn't matter? So I'm not an e Should I be turning his hand? Yeah. So, so I'm not an economist, so I have to watch out that I don't go out too far on thin ice. Um, I did wonder, looking at the graph, which looked more or less flat, um, and one can't do um, counterfactuals. So I don't know how it would have looked if we didn't have these revolutions that, that, that actually have taken place. And maybe there are some sort of a continual process of revolutions. I guess one could study that over time. And perhaps there is some accounting for that in the curve. Um, but uh, I guess it's a question for economists, not for computer scientists. I do, I do wonder, though, um, I, of course, you're measuring one thing there, right? And that is, uh, it's, it's an economic entity, and, and there are many other aspects to our life. Absolutely. You know, we, live, we live longer, uh, presumably we uh, enjoy more of our lifetime, we're more well, um, we don't work as many strenuous jobs, and certainly technology is playing a role there. Absolutely, and there's substitution, so I, I mean, without uh, new, new technologies, the, the, what we would probably see is that the old technologies would survive much, much longer, and we would maybe have an even more flatter curve or a stable curve at a certain level. I'm, I'm absolutely with you. The only thing I try to say is don't count on any of these trendy things to pull us out of the slump that we have gotten ourselves into. It's a very natural, normal process, which probably in the end also is, um, is very helpful when it comes to sustainable <coughs> and the development of the world. And as with every empirical observation, there might be the induction problem, as the philosophers call it, uh, that, 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 if that that's just the past. Maybe quantum physics <laughs> will change everything. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's an inter interesting uh, observation. Uh, if we have, for example, quantum computers, we can solve many problems that are business relevant, optimization, actually uh, in security, there are many things that you could solve quite efficiently with quantum computers. That would really be a breakthrough. Yeah, but the, the, this is, let me tell you a funny story. I, I, I sometimes sit on panels like that and also with ETH people. And mm -hmm. I had the, the pleasure of uh, have, spending some time with Mr. Godzilla, as I always call him you know, the, the previous president, I think, or still president of the university. And he always has this example that this little thing is like 10 million more, oper can do 10 million more operations than the whole of NASA's computer power had when they sent the men to the moon. The problem is this thing still doesn't get me to the moon. Right? So this is what I, I struggle yeah. to believe. But it can it's kill you via the pacemaker. <laughs> That's a very, very nice That's thing. progress, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Or at least many people in the banking industry would say that's progress. So I don't have a pacemaker. <laughs> but is there a really big thing around the corner, maybe with quantum physics, or are we talking about longer? Um, uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, we're referring to, to, I mean, there are many different things going on, but I guess you mean that there'll be quantum computers which can factor numbers quickly and solve optimization yeah, problems. Yeah, no security problems um, left. Well, actually, that'll cause huge security problems. Okay. So, so <laughs> all of our security, whenever you have an SSL connection, a TLS connection to your bank and things like that, it's based uh -huh. on public key cryptography, which will be immediately broken when we have public key, when we have quantum computers. It might even be that the NSA, or perhaps GCHQ, um, has powerful enough quantum computers today that they can break cryptography. We just don't know. What is your thinking about quantum computers? 
Well, I think it's one of those things that in the military, we are always looking for the next technology which may give us some advantage. And that's, that's a big question for us. We're not worried where the money comes from. We're <laughs> saying, right, we want money to, to make the next technology work better than the last one. And so if your submarine is not working today, how can we make it work, work better or get a new one which is simpler, which does the job uh, quicker and better than the one before? And look at these fighter aircraft. We produce fighter aircraft after fighter aircraft after fighter aircraft. A lot of them we've never used. But it's always been the new technology we've been looking for. So I don't think it means anything to growth within the military, but what it means we're looking for that uh, new, new idea. Quantum physics... Yes, it's there, and I've been uh, involved a, a little bit in, in the States with NSA on this, and there's no doubt that they have got some new systems on which they claim are going to change the world, but I haven't seen any results as so far. Okay. Then, second scandalous uh, hypothesis. Uh, Dr. Veloshoff tells us politics don't matter. <laughs> And I th you spent your life to protect us and to, pro I, th I think, in order to uh, guarantee free uh, democratic uh, lifestyle and things. Politics only matter in, in our world, in NATO, uh, when we go to what's called the North Atlantic Council, where we have all these representatives from the nations. And they're all supposed to be tied into the nations to have the latest thought from the nations. But when you look around, you find they're making up the policy as they go along around this table. And they only afterwards refer back to the nations. So, as Klaus says, it's all a bit of a, a false dawn in my view. You're not, the politics doesn't matter to a degree. They will like, take the decision in the end. But whether it's the right one or not is going to be a matter of, of, of a debate and considerable debate both at the council and in the nations. And... The t thing about NATO is it, w it has worked because we've had the military alongside the politicians. And so we've had realism against, beside politics. And that has worked to a degree. To a degree. At least you acknowledge that f politics might matter a little bit uh, with regard to war and peace. Oh, and also to the way that we live. I mean, yeah. you just imagine that we would, uh, Switzerland would leave the Schengen Treaty. We would have... Uh, very strange things at the border. You have to show your passport and things like that, and people wouldn't want that. So it's, it's the way we live, and, and this is all of that, and I grant you immediately, is much more important than economics. Yeah. My hypothesis was on for growth and for income and for financial markets. And But don't we, uh, do we no longer believe in the, the, this idea that best system for good economics is liberal democracy, and we should fight for it? And the best system to live in, this is a very personal statement, it's probably not something that economists could make, but the best system to live in is a liberal de democracy. But uh, if you look at the growth performance of uh, some of the larger countries in this world, you, you might be persuaded that in terms of growth, in terms of creating income, in terms of creating value uh, in investments, uh, something like the Chinese system is the better one. And we now have a crazy guy in, in Brazil. I hope somebody does something before he's elected. Um, I'm sure the stock markets go through the roof when he's elected. The, the REI will, will increase in value. It will last two or three years. And all will, everything will end in shambles and the society will be destroyed. So it's, it's not that easy. I mean, the, the, if, you, if you open the FT... And you read the newspaper, or the NZZ, you read the newspaper, and they will tell you, oh, this is all oh, the politicians, and now Europe will fall apart. Well, it's nonsense. Europe will not fall apart because of Italy's debt or deficits or anything. It will fall apart because of politics. As a, a NATO official, did you, or would you, if you were uh, in charge right now, uh, care a lot about, uh, be worried about these political uh, things like in Italy and uh, new rulers, Brexiteers, they're taking power maybe. I, I don't think you do. The military is, is there and it's been established there for the last 50 years or 60 years in NATO. And what, what these, it, there'll be pressures from time to time as there are. I mean, I mean it, Hungary, the Czech Republic, uh, uh, um, Slovakia, places like this. And I think what we've got to say is we just work through that for a, a period. And as Klaus says, these, these people are there. A liberal democracy is what we're looking for. And we try and persuade them to live by the ideals which we've put forward in the basic statements. Before uh, your speech, I, I thought also that maybe blockchain technology could <laughs> protect the uh, perfectly a, a liberal way of living, a free way of living, because there is no more power, central power needed to control everything. Uh, not true? Well, I, 
blockchain, it, it, it's like a hammer looking for a nail. Everybody is just screaming, <laughs> this will solve all of your problems. It really depends on what the problem is, so what, 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 what problem you would like to solve. And also it depends critically on your trust assumptions, and also blockchain is not blockchain. There are many different ways of doing it. Let me just give one example to, 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 to make the point about why this may not be the hammer for all nails. Um, I've been involved looking at uh, questions of electronic voting and creating new government services and things like this. And some people have said, wouldn't it be nice if all real estate transactions were on a blockchain? So the, the Grundbuch here in der Schweiz, yeah, if that was on a, a blockchain, yeah. then you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to have governments responsible for this. You could just have things under the people. It would be much more efficient. It would be much more cheap. cheap. But why do you have a... What, what, what's the English for Grünbuch? Uh, um, a real estate registry. Registry. Yeah. Why do you Why do you have a registry? I mean, I presume you have a registry because if somebody is squatting on your land, you can prove that you own it, and the police will come take them off, right? So ultimately, you need to have trust in the state for that to be worth anything. And once you have trust in the state, you can have a state-run registry. Just as an example. So you need to be very, very clear about your underlying trust assumptions to know when this distribution makes sense. And also, of course, if it's algorithmically feasible and all of the other aspects. General, could one say that trust is still the most important currency in the world? And uh, in, in, in that perspective, the, uh, Article 5 is kind of the backbone of the, of the Western narrative. Yeah, we, I mean, it has been and it continues to be trust. We, that's what we have to build ourselves on. If we don't have the trust, we go nowhere. And we've had to say to people, look, you, you are now getting to the state where your, let's say, behavior, and I would take Turkey for his example, is unacceptable. What are, we don't trust you anymore to do what you said you were going to do. What are you going to do to put that right? And uh, we've had de um, deputations going to Turkey to try and persuade them. It's m having some, ch uh, some uh, success, but it's not being totally successful at the moment. But trust is the, is the key. Is the key. Uh, and it's the the paradigm of, of Western culture so far, but Donald Trump, you don't have to <laughs> uh, say something about him, but you may. Uh, I, I mean, I think even very consciously, very strategically, is trying to destroy the idea that what you say should, should be uh, the, the same today as tomorrow. He's, he's introducing another system. Well, I had some friends come and stay from Albuquerque last week, and they, were, they lived in, uh, 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 let's say, a, a businessman. They were all Trump supporters. It surprised me. And they said he's doing what's right for us because he, he said he was going to do it and he's doing it. I said, what about the moral compass? What about the things about trust? We're not interested in that. We're interested in our, uh, ourselves. And it's really selfish. There's a selfish element to people. And that's what I was surprised about. That's for an economist, it's not a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but would, I, would, I, would, I would caution yeah. us not to put all the blame on Trump. No. I mean, we have the same developments in European countries, um, in Germany and Britain. They're less powerful. Switzerland was, a, well, was a, I would say, a, a trendsetter in that, a populist right-wing movement or... But it's different. It was not as Swiss radical. Swiss always different. That's yeah. What they, you know, yeah. 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 Even the way you get the children... When, uh, when the German says we're, we're different, you don't like it, I think. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's so radical. Uh, I, I, but any, anyway... Um, anyway? Um, it started earlier, actually. I, when I lived in the States, that was in the early 90s, we had this election campaign between um, Mr. Bush and Mr. Clint, uh, was, uh, Clinton. Yes. Yeah, I know he's not the first liar you know in the, American politics. You know what the two but words were that, 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 that were central there? It was trust versus change, and the Americans voted for change. Yeah. But still, I, at university uh, those times, I learned that uh, Adam Smith was a moral philosopher at the same time. So no, 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 not at the same time, in the, uh, in the first place. Uh, oh, in the first place. So <laughs> my question is, would you still say that these moral questions about values you talked about, are values that are in danger, are still fundamental for also the, our economic system? Well, this is where economics comes from, right? I mean, um, uh, economics has been a normative, uh, social, whatever. I don't, I'm not really sure whether it's a science, but social endeavor. Um, uh, since its beginnings, and we trace them back to antiquity. Um, and it's only in, since, the since the late 19th century that there was a stronger uh, f force that tried to push normative questions out of economics. <coughs> uh, in my worldview, it's absolutely essential that we, have, uh, that we gain 
the moral high ground back into the argument. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll lose the credibility. That's one my, the main fear I expressed there, right? We, we should force ourselves not to make promises that we can't hold, and the financial services industry is still doing it, and that even louder so since the financial crisis. So with Switzerland still being a real democracy, in my eyes, I will uh, have the participation of the people here by uh, voting with this card. Given the cybersecurity threat matrix, why should Switzerland introduce uh, these new uh, e-voting mechanisms? Are you um, skeptical about, about this? Uh, it would require a longer answer, so I'm not sure how much time well, you have. <laughs> I'm generous. So, you have so, a minute. So I'm, I'm actually okay. <laughs> so I'm actually very familiar with it, um, uh, and actually, the the uh, many people have the wrong impression about how e-voting works. They think you do something on your server, it goes onto a computer, so, uh, some, some, something on your client, it goes to a server somewhere, and of course, if your client is corrupted or the server is corrupted, you can change the results of elections. Modern protocols are much, much more sophisticated. The ones that are currently being considered in Switzerland have extremely high requirements. They have requirements like universal verifiability, so everybody can check that the tally is properly computed. So even if the server is completely corrupted, I could find that. Um, they have the property of individual verifiability. Even if the adversary completely controls my platform, I can still check that my, my vote was recorded as cast. Um, and it is possible to design protocols with all these properties. Nevertheless, of course, it's very difficult to know that the implementation ultimately achieves what's being promised. Um, in Switzerland, there are actually very high standards for doing this, okay. where one has but to But why would we do it? I mean, talking about trust, uh, a paper, uh, one paper, one man, one woman, uh, it's a good thing because that somewhere in a cellar we do still have the papers we can recount. It was a good thing. No, but you, you can get the equivalent of the paper. There still is a question, why would you do it? Maybe this is a question for economists. Maybe people like to take part in the democratic process where they go to their Gemeinde and they physically cast okay. their vote. Um, but do. this is a different question. Um, in security, what quite a lot can be done. There is an economic answer to it. You want to lower the transaction cost of a vote, and by that you hope that you can increase participation in votes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's one of the major pro problems of the Swiss dem direct democracy, as you know, is the voter turnout is very low. So if, if you have a control of 25% of the voting population, you will win every uh, The referendum. other 75 agree. Well, uh, but I, I always said if you want to stay home, you're m m welcome. But okay, we have a lot of questions. That's so another proof that you didn't follow the your economics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just another kind of professor, I guess. Uh, Peter Chop. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, that that was a politician in Switzerland. Uh, uh, did NATO not pro provoke Russia by taking in the Baltic states? Yeah, I mean, that has been a question for a long time. But at the time that um, we took them all in from Eastern Europe and the Baltic states, a, a great Secretary General called Manfred Werner, who was a German, was very far-sighted. These states were going nowhere. They were lo lost. And he offered uh, them a democratic, uh, a chance to join the democratic societies. Uh, Russia saw that as a provocation. But I don't think we were wrong to do it. I think it was right at the time to do it. But Russia, of course, is using that as propaganda now to, uh, let's say, push their particular cause. And that's what's happened in Ukraine, East and, and uh, Crimea, et cetera, et cetera. But well, it's not only a question of taking them in. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the people wanted to join oh, NATO. And yes, they wanted us. Yeah. In my worldview, it's the right of a people to actually choose their destiny. But they didn't vote for it, really. We took them in. That's what Manfred, I remember going with Manfred Werner to, to <laughs> Estonia, and it was the people there said, yes, we want you. But we were talking to the hierarchy of the country. We weren't talking to the people out on the borders. Uh, what would be the reaction of NATO if two NATO countries are at war? For example, Greece and Turkey. How do I answer that? We've watched this for years and years and years. Little, little islands have become problems. There's been incursions by aircraft, etc. 
We have experts in all the military headquarters on how to deal with this. And it's such a big subject, I don't even want to touch it. What I would say to you is Greece and Turkey is a particular case, and we've managed it for the last 50 years, and I think we can still manage it. But if we did come to that situation, I think we, uh, NATO would find it extremely difficult, and we would, we would really, it would uh, test the alliance to the, to the uh, limit. It really would. What model should we use for asset management? For asset allocation? I, I, I think we know more than nothing. I mean, this naive allocation assumes we know very little and we don't, have no clue about the future. That's not true. But as a starting point, the naive model is better than what we do at the moment. Mm -hmm. So if you add to it the little things where you have um, reason to believe that you have knowledge that you can forecast, for example, be it correlations or, or returns, you might want to change away from, skew away from equally weighted portfolio. But otherwise, I think the only solid and, and in line with your ethical standards as CFAs, the only way that you can provide that service to clients is to do a naive allocation. Otherwise, you have to leave the organization, gentlemen. <laughs> I have a problem with the handwriting here. Isn't the issue or discount? No, it's about the, it's about the soccer game tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> or the upper room. Sorry, uh, can you read it? <laughs> no. so I, I should have asked for... Uh, iPhone communication, <laughs> um, maybe because this, why are you, really, I'm really sorry. Um, Let's invent some questions. <laughs> uh, or, or find somewhere. Can we go back and reduce complexity uh, to be more secure in, in the digital world? Um, as individuals, you can, but you may not want to. So throw <laughs> away your smartphone and use a dumb phone. Throw away your computer and use a notepad. Go back to faxes. Or use the new internet, because I had the pleasure to moderate another conference, and there was a colleague of yours, Adrian yes. Perrick, yes. and he told us, well, I, I don't know if that, that's right, uh, they are inventing a new internet. No so, so I can say something about that too. That I didn't want to kind of toot my own horn, but that was the little teaser I had at the end of the slide. So together with two colleagues at ETH, we're working on a new internet that you can run alongside the old internet and get substantially higher security properties, such as um, freedom from denial of service attacks, uh, freedom from kill switches, ability to isolate what's happening within uh, particular countries or regions. Um, the protocols are orders of magnitude based and simpler than the existing protocols on the internet. And it works, and it's being used by, by the Swiss administration and some Swiss companies today. Well, NATO should be desperately interested in that. We are. They should be. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so there might be. needs money. <laughs> Is it very expensive? Yes. No, 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 Professor no, no, no. Gary Perry told us it's just for a few thousand francs you can have exactly, one. Exactly. In fact, we could have the most secure Put up a hat network the in the world the in <laughs> Switzerland. We worked out the price for the price of about um, 200 meters of Autobahn. Oh, really? Okay, that's worth it. I think uh, so. Depending on the 200 meters, if it's in the gutter. Uh, so my last round would just be uh, the following questions: Might we have forgotten some hidden black swans completely tonight, or some hidden stabilizers? But my, my, might there be something that we didn't talk about and we should have, or not? I mean, from the technology standpoint, there are the possibility for breakthroughs. So I mentioned one possibility networking and also that the engineering methods mature, but that won't be enough. I mean, there's a question of who will pay for security and who wants security. And not all parties want it and most aren't yet willing to pay for it. Hidden black swan or stabilizer? I think it's funding. Funding is our, uh, it, it, I mentioned it, but it's our, our our real problem, if you're going to have defense, you're going to have to pay for it. And it, you have to look at what you want. Because at the present moment, we've, le we've learned to look at the model that's available, tanks, missiles, aircraft, whatever. Are we going to change that paradigm and go somewhere else? And that, I think, is the black swan we've got to ask ourselves. Where do we want to spend in the future? Your favorite black swan, or I hope? My favorite black swan is the media. We didn't talk about the role of the media. Um, and Happy about that because <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. You are completely right. I would probably agree. Yeah. It's a we have a structural problem there. Yeah. I think with yeah. the good journalists are leaving and starting to moderate <laughs> useless panel <laughs> sessions. 
Um, uh, yeah. and uh, information and management as well. It's Gresham's it, yeah. law in, in the media, right? Bad journalism drives out good journalism to a very large extent. Absolutely. And that, that makes it very Still difficult. media like New York Times, Washington Post trying to set Absolute, a counter absolutely. trend. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's yes. but it's a real niche, right? Yeah. And if you live in a country that uh, where most people don't really speak English and use English media, that's very yeah. difficult. And you look at the Swiss media landscape. Uh, and can I just add one? Propaganda. We are tuffling today for a great deal from propaganda, which we listen from all over the world. And whatever situation, it's very difficult to get the real facts on, a, on, a, on something that's happening. And I think that, from the defense point of view, uh, your action depends on knowing those facts. And the, and, the, and the media are really getting lazy. I mean, we have a very strange situation in this country. One uh, national institution has just la or recently launched the biggest state intervention ever of around 600 billion Swiss francs. That's one, one, one time GDP. And nobody is criticizing that. And this is the Swiss National Bank, who has uh, completely overmarched its, uh, its, its mandate. Uh, and there's no, it, and media is absolutely silent on this. But that's the black swan. Uh, we didn't talk about that. Not the National Bank. Uh, OK. Um, no. and, but, there's, uh, and, but fundamentally, I think I would disagree with what you said. Um, the, the, the first picture I've shown, in my, my interpretation, shows how resilient the world is or a, a, a system like the US economy is, and I think the Swiss economy is the same, Europe is the same. Um, the problem is a lack of redundancy. I think that's just the cybersecurity problem put in another w phrasing, right? If we all use the same system, the I same IP protocol to put it onto the internet, we have a problem. But as long as we remain redundant, as long as Europe remains 27 countries, um, 26, 29. my apologies, 29, well, <laughs> 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 Montenegro is very important. Oh yeah, that's, that's for sure. I think uh, we don't need to worry that much. And, and finally, I'm, I'm not a Swiss. I mean, I live here since 34 years or something. Um, you can see how, 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 how um, appealing your society is to foreigners, that I didn't get a passport. Um, <laughs> uh, one, one thing I think that, that um, that we shouldn't uh, lose out of sight is, and this is what the Swiss direct democracy system is built on, that people are not stupid. Um, I, I think we, we might be tempted to be swayed in one direction at the moment as the Western societies, but I, I, I have absolute, um, ab absolute faith in intellect and intelligence and, uh, and, and new technologies actually will help us to get rid of the propaganda um, as well. It's not only a threat, but it's also a strength. Let us conclude on this positive note. And before handing over uh, back to our uh, host, uh, I, uh, I will corroborate what you say with uh, Winston Churchill, uh, mentioned already. But uh, let's also quote him one more time, because he said, of course, I'm an optimist. There doesn't seem to be much use in being a pessimist. Thank you, gentlemen. A pause for my part. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panel very much. I'd like to thank you, the audience. Um, but we have some small gifts for our panelists before they leave. And I think I'll start with our, uh, our star pessimist, <laughs> Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you have to work on your message. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't have to work oh, on the message, but on thanks. the delivery. <laughs> <laughs> on the audience. Uh, Claus, uh, I think one of the things we've learned from you is that we can rely on the long-term uh, trends and fashions to continue despite rationality. And I want to give you this package of tulip bulbs so that you can sit in your garden and remember that all these fashions have come and gone since the time of the uh, Dutch tulip uh, bulb. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Klaus. <laughs> I like that. And now uh, for NATO, as we know from, uh, from Tim's chart, Switzerland is not part of NATO, but we'd still like to make a small contribution of a Swiss army knife. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then uh, for David, um, with all the cybersecurity, apparently there's no security anywhere, 
but we've noticed that there's a small little gadget that will protect your credit cards from being scanned. I'm sure that David will tell me that this is absolutely uh, useless, <laughs> but just in case, we give him... <laughs> Thank you. And now for uh, Stefan and Isabel, uh, the journalist, uh, always looking for truth and bringing out the truth, and for which, obviously, we rely heavily. Um, but ultimately, in these days, it might be uh, uh, in vino veritas. <laughs> <laughs> so we give a bottle to Stefan and to Isabel with their thanks. Thank you so much. But our biggest thanks is really to you, the audience, and uh, thank you very much for coming out. I think that for my, from my side, it's been very enlightening. We got past the sound bites, past the tweets, and I think that that's the important issue, that the uh, 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 well-informed adults making up our society is what we really have to rely on. And so thank you very much for uh, coming out to be perhaps a bit better informed as a result. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite you now to enjoy uh, our apéro riche outside uh, provided by the Barrow Lock. Thank you very much. <laughs>